I teach mathematics over in Williamsport at the Pennsylvania College of Technology. And sometimes they talk about mathematics as being the international language. I was looking at your board in the other room there, and I couldn't read any of the Russian, but I recognized the numbers. And while we all use the same numbers, the music, I think, really comes through. Even the music that I didn't understand touched me. It's that melody, that song, you understand it. I especially loved the first one, how deep, deep love of God. And that's what I hope to talk a little bit about tonight. He left his glory in heaven to come down for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ loved us. You've probably never heard of Martha Schisler, but she and her invalid, invalid mother left Florida down in the southern part of the country for some medical appointments that she had up in the northern Midwest in Indiana. When they got there to the hotel, Martha had brought a book with her to read that night, but she was so unduly troubled and worried about her mother that she, that novel just didn't seem right. She looked over on the bedstand, and there was a book there. She picked up that book. Martha and her mother weren't churchgoers. She wasn't familiar really with the Bible. To her, it was just like any other book. And she started right at the front cover, like she would with any other book, started on the first page, and started reading from Genesis. She got to the story of Joseph and God's providential care for Joseph there in Egypt impressed her so much that she had to wake up her mother and read that story to her mother. They spent a week in the motel, and Martha continually read some more of the stories. Some she read to herself, some she read aloud to her mother. When they left the hotel at the end of the month, as I said, Martha and her mother weren't churchgoers. They didn't have a Bible. They took that Bible out of the motel room with them. Now, we don't necessarily recommend that you go take the Bibles out of the hotel rooms, but if you don't have one, we'll replace it. But they took that Bible home with them to Florida, continued reading it, and at the end of a month, they both gave their lives to Jesus. Martha and her mother were both very glad that someone had placed that Bible in that motel room. We estimate that over its lifetime of about six years, each motel Bible has a possibility to reach about 2,300 different readers. I thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you tonight on behalf of the Gideons International. My notes here say that most of you are probably aware of our work, but some of you may not be aware of our work. We, and, and that's what I'm going to tell you about tonight. Um, if you've been in most of the hotels, most of the hotels in this country have Gideon Bibles in them. Um, one of my favorite sort, one of my favorite experiences, I guess, over in Williamsport, we have just recently built several new motels. Um, the internet, the Little League World Series, is there each August. And when we first moved there, probably about 20 years ago, each August there were many more people that came to town than the town was able to accommodate. And I suspect that over the last six or seven years, there have probably been seven or eight motel chains brand new that have gone up. And just about without fail, about a month before they, they're ready to open their doors, they've called us and said, we are going to open our doors and start bringing in travelers in a month. Uh, we wanted to let you know so that you would have Bibles on hand and be able to place Bibles in the hotel rooms. So the motels actually called us to make sure that we had the Bibles available to put in those motel rooms. So each year we go around and we replace Bibles. We make sure that each room has a Bible in there for the travelers so that just like Martha, when God is there to speak to them, God is there. We take, um, we are a interdenominational group of Christian business men and women 
that take very seriously the word that God gave Isaiah in the 55th chapter and the 11th verse. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish the purposes to which I have sent it. We place God's word in various places. We trust God to use it for his purposes. There are now almost 200,000 Gideons serving as an extended missionary arm of your church in over 200 different countries throughout the world. We have a presence in almost every country in the world except those that are predominantly communistic like northern Vietnam, North Korea, and those that are um, Muslim countries, Iran, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, but just about every other country we have a, a Gideon presence. And I was surprised to learn this summer, this past summer, that we are actually making inroads into the Republic of China and getting a, a number of copies of the word there. Our purpose is the same as yours, both individually and as a group, to win men, women, boys, and girls to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. We make God's word available not only in motels and hotels, but also elementary and secondary schools, hospitals, convalescent homes, jails, military induction centers, on college and university campuses, or for that matter, wherever God opens doors. We trust God to accomplish his purpose with his word. Um, we just recently, within the last couple of months, had a distribution over here at Penn State in State College, and were able to stand on campus and as students walked down the sidewalk to and from the classroom, we were able to ask them if they would like a free copy of God's Word, if they would like a free New Testament. I, and I want to say they passed out a little better than 3,000 scriptures um, there. That will make a difference in people's lives. Jill Kelly was an advanced medical technician that was working at the cleanup in New York City after the tragedy in 9-11 in 2001. As she was working there at Ground Zero, a Gideon approached her and gave her a small New Testament like this. Jill was a churchgoer, knew Christ, but over the years she had fallen away from the church and wasn't as up to her relationship with God had fallen back. As she got back to the relief shelter, she took that New Testament and started reading it. As she read it, it caused her to rededicate her life to Jesus. As she went back to ground zero the next day, a man emerged from the wreckage and he was pretty well tattered. She fixed him up as best she could, fixed his um, cuts and wounds and gave him what, she, what support she could. As she was fixing him up, he noticed that New Testament and asked Jill if she would be willing to trade that New Testament for a battered artificial rose that he had. Jill said sure, and she took that New Testament and at that time wrote her pager number in the front cover of the New Testament and traded him that New Testament for that artificial rose. A couple of summers later, she received a phone call. It was this same gentleman, and he said, Praise God, I have hope in my life now because I have God in my life. And I like to say there's God's word doing double duty. One New Testament, two lives changed. And that's just how it is as we distribute the scriptures. As we give the scripture to someone, we're, we don't really know how God's going to use it. He may pass it on to someone else. They may pass it on to someone else, but God will use it and will achieve his purposes. Just as with Jill's New Testament, many of the Bibles we place in the hotel rooms do double duty. As I said, we go through each year and we check and make sure that these Bibles in the motel rooms are clean, up to date. Every now and then we'll find some, and I used to carry one, that was pretty well written up on the back here, and I know what happens as people say in the motel rooms, especially with young children, the children get bored, they don't have anything to write with, 
I said, well, here's some blank paper. Take the pen and, and write and keep the kids busy. We go through, we take those Bibles and we remove them out of the hotel rooms and we place nice, clean copies of God's Word in there. We take those old copies of God's Word and give them to the prisons and let the prisons use them. Ricky Sarton was arrested in, on May 2005. He was imprisoned. Two days later, he met with the prison chaplain. The prison chaplain had some New Testaments. He asked Ricky if he would like one. Ricky said, sure, why not? He took it, went back to his cell, threw it up on the shelf, and promptly forgot about it. A little bit later, he was transferred from that facility to another facility where he was locked down for 24 hours or 23 hours a day. He had one hour a day when he got out of his cell. As he was sitting in that cell, he remembered that New Testament that he had been given, and with nothing else to do, he found it, started reading it. It took him seven days to read it all the way through. The second time, it only took him six days to read it all the way through. And on the back cover, he wrote his decision for Christ. And I like to say that that New Testament literally saved his life there. Ed and Jim, Ed, Ed and Jim Potsky had gotten lost after leaving a Gideon camp meeting in Minneapolis. I like this particular return for two reasons. One, I grew up outside Minneapolis in St. Paul, so I got lost many times in Minneapolis. I can identify with that in Jim. The other reason is they got lost in a big city. I don't know, some of you may have gone to Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, the big city. It's easy to get lost. They were leaving a um, camp meeting there in Minneapolis, and they were trying to find their way back to the interstate, and they got lost on some of the side streets there in Minneapolis. Uh, they found themselves lost in a deserted area. As they drove, they spotted a group of rough-looking men standing huddled together talking. Being from a small town, Ed had faith in his fellow man and stopped to ask directions. Being from a small town, Jim wasn't too sure about other people, and he decided to stay in the car. You know, and we all have those reactions. Some of us have one or the other. Some of us see the group of people out there, and we say, oh, yeah, they'll help me. Some of us see a group of people out there and say, oh, I want to stay away from them. Right? There's Jim and Ed. Ed went over and started talking to them. He wanted to find out if they had instructions back to the freeway. In his conversation with the group of men, Ed discovered that one of them was a new Christian and was using his Gideon New Testament to witness to his friends. The man had become a Christian in prison, just been released from prison, and now was sharing his newfound faith with his friends. When he learned that Ed was a Christian, he asked Ed, he said, do you know where I could find five New Testaments for my friends here? And Ed said, well, maybe. Let me go over to the car and check. He went back over to his car, and he just happened to have five more New Testaments in his car that he brought back and shared with these other gentlemen. Um, Jim got out of there. Jim, Ed just happened to have four personal workers testaments in his car, so he told the men to follow him, and he would get them. Jim got out of the car and was introduced to the men. Ed reached into the car, pulled out the New Testament, and gave one to each of the men. After being showed the helps and the plan of salvation, the men joyfully joined in prayer. Now, I ask you, what are the chances that two men could be lost Stop to ask directions from a group of men and just happen to have the five Bibles that they needed. Some of us look at that story and say, oh, wow, what a coincidence. I look at that story and say, the hand of God. Wow, the love of God that he would provide those men at just that right time with those Bibles. We know the Lord had his hand in these events. We also distribute scriptures internationally. Um, one of the, ex and I couldn't wait to come tonight to, sh to share this. Uh, sorry, I, I share this as I go around speaking. 
One of the exciting new areas of ministry is in the former Soviet Union. In one of their first distributions, Russian Gideons were given four lecture halls in the University of Moscow. They daily had full houses of faculty and students who came to hear about Christianity and receive a copy of God's word. Over 23,000 scriptures were distributed there at the university that week, which is remarkable in itself. But later, a Gideon was speaking in a large church in Canada. And on that same program where the Gideon was speaking in Canada was a pianist, and the pianist was Russian. And as that Gideon was speaking about this distribution in the University of Moscow, the Russian pianist came forward and said, yes, I was there, and I received the New Testament at that distribution. And I took it because the New Testament was bilingual. It had Russian in one column and English on the other column, and I took it so that I could improve my English. I wanted to be an international pianist, and I knew in order to do that, I would have to know English better. So I took that New Testament so that I could read the Russian and then read the English translation and learn the English that way. As he read it, God spoke to him, and he ended up giving his life to Jesus. You know, and that's how this works so often. People take the scriptures not so they can learn about God. Maybe they're just being polite. And as I say, would you like a New Testament? They say, okay. But then when they get it and they read it, God speaks to them. This is not like any other book. This truly is the word of God. And as we open it, the creator of this world speaks to us. This is probably out of place. But one of the things, this is an easy ministry for me. This ministry is not about me. It's about God. It's a work that God does. And I can, we have a distribution at Penn College at the school where I teach. Now I can't, in the classroom, pull out the Bible and start reading the Bible to the students. But I am able, as a member of the Gideons, to stand out on the sidewalks when we have our yearly distribution and hand out scriptures. And as my students come by, I can give them a copy of God's word. As fellow faculty members come by, I can give them a copy of God's word. And one day as I was doing that, one of the students came back out of the classroom and sort of whispered in my ear, he says, it's working. I saw two people in there reading it. And that's the idea. As they take it, as they open it up, and as they read it, those words the creator speaks to them. Another way we distribute scriptures internationally is through a program where a number of individuals from the more affluent countries will go to some of the less affluent countries and help the camps down there distribute scriptures. We send scriptures ahead. They get down there in a group of five or six or ten, and they'll go out and distribute scriptures. Jim Reed talked about being down there, and he was down in Paraguay, and he talked about the impact they had down there in the schools. And he was able to go into the schools. They walked up and down the school classrooms and gave each student sitting at their desk a copy of a Spanish New Testament. As they left, the administration said that they were very thankful that they had brought those New Testaments in because this was a very poor district they were unable to afford reading books for the students, and they were going to use those New Testaments for their reading books. Can you imagine the impact that that will have on their lives? Many times as we distribute New Testament or a Bible, we don't know what impact it will have. But we take comfort in the words found in 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You've heard this evening how our work has not been in vain. We've distributed God's word, and he's used it for his purposes. People come to know Jesus Christ the Savior. 
when they receive and read the New Testaments and Bibles. What can you do to help assist this ministry and help fulfill the Great Commission? First, and by far most important, you can pray for us. As I said, this really is not a work that I do. It's a work that God does. And God only does that work through the faithful prayers of his faithful people. As you pray, you can pray that we have distributions open for us, places that will receive God's word, places that we can pass it out. As I talked about the um, Paraguayan school, that's one of the issues on my heart. We can't get into most elementary schools anymore. And that's one thing that you can pray for. Pray that those doors are open. You can thank God that we can get into some of the universities and that people there do receive God's word. You can pray that as they receive God's word, as they take those Bibles, as they read them, that God speaks to them and they listen. It, it, it always sort of amazes me that we have so many of the, the people that talk about it coming out of the prisons where they were in the prison and seemed to have hit a low point in their life, picked up the Bible, read it, and the love of God came through to them. People, you know, I, I talk to people and people say, Oh, the Bible, I can't understand it. It doesn't make sense to me. Those words, I don't understand how they put together. It just doesn't make any sense. And yet, one time they'll pick it up, and all of a sudden, it does make sense. God has spoke to them. They have started listening. As Eli talked about tonight, words have a big meaning. And sometimes we're ready to hear those words. Sometimes they aren't. Pray for us. Pray that as they read the word of God, that God does speak to them, that they listen. Your prayers make everything possible. Um, secondly, you can. we need some financial support. If you are able and willing to support us financially, we don't really need your money. My God is able to supply all of our needs through Christ Jesus. But if you're willing and able, and if you feel the call from God, I want to give you that opportunity. Um, you received, and I didn't bring it with me, a bulletin similar to this when you came in. One way that you can give is with that envelope, just tear the envelope off the back, put a distribution, and you can mail it right to us. Um, on the back of the page, the Gideons International, we have a nice uh, Gideons.org and you can go on the website. For those, of you that, for those of you that have your smartphone with you, and I can see that there are some younger people than me. My kids can do this. I don't know how to. But we have the QRC code here, and you can sit right there at your seat right now with your smartphone and give however you do that with that. But I know it's possible. As I, as I say, my kids can, I can't. Or... You can use the Gideon Card program. We have greeting cards that are available on the website that you can get from there. They're just like regular greeting cards that you would buy at, at Walmart, and they have a nice um, space in there where you can write a personal greeting and then give a donation to the Gideons. My, my kids ask me, you know, Dad, what would you like for Father's Day or Christmas or my birthday? And I tell them, I don't need anything. All you have to do is look in my garage, and you'll know that I don't need anything. Right there is a perfect gift for the man that has everything. Give Bibles in his name, and lives will be changed. Because you prayed, were involved, and gave financially, Gideons have been able to distribute God's word. Gideons went to a motel in Orange County, California. And as the Gideons got to the motel, the owner sort of put his hands up in the air and said, hallelujah. An inspector from that motel had been there that week and had written up 15 deficiencies. Deficiency number seven was no Bibles in the hotel rooms. Gideons were thus able to place 150 Bibles in those hotel rooms. I have one more story that I think really illustrates the global nature of our work. 
Uh, this is an entry from the journal of Matthew and Marcy Martin, who are missionaries in East Africa. Now, I don't normally think about missionaries as being tourists, but that's what this sounds like. And if you stop and think about it, most missionaries go off to a part of the world that they've never seen before. Um, and that's what Martha and Mar Matthew and Marcy did here. Four of us in our group decided that we would like to hike out into the bush to explore and hopefully see some wildlife. We began hiking, taking extra care to remember the way we came because there was no road or trail to follow. We walked for a few hours and came upon a Maasai village. I knew we were far from civilization when some of the children ran screaming in fear because they had never seen a white man before. When it was about time to head back to camp, a man invited us to his campground for tea. We agreed a little hesitantly. As we began talking, though, we discovered that he was a believer in Christ. We asked him if he could read the word of God to us in his own language. He gave an excited smile, ran back to the back of the hut, and grabbed his Bible, probably the only one within miles. I immediately recognized it as a Gideon New Testament. How awesome is the power of God and his word that it can be found way out in the African bush, even far from African civilization. God really does send his word to the far-flung portions of the world. In closing, the Gideon message can be remembered very easily this evening by remembering three M's. We are the men of the church using the money of the church to take the message of the church to the world. Thank you very much for your time and attention this evening. Thank you. <laughs>